You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Hey, everybody. It's just Mike. Hey. Mike, are you uh, eating some cereal there, it oh. looks like? Hi, Chris. Hey. You caught me in the middle of breakfast. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, who who is track. that guy? Okay. Wait a minute. Well, what? Go ahead. No, I'm right here. See you. Is hey. this Inception? <laughs> What's going on? Alternate reality? <laughs> Alternate parallel universe? Wait, you were he You were there, and now you're here. Uh, yeah, and now I'm back. What? So, as, as in the title, this show is about what is reality, really. And uh, so I thought... Uh, I do a little little spoof using my virtual fireplace and uh, another little video. So here we are. You're, you're seeing multiple of me. <laughs> okay. It's one mic, Chris. Let's let's talk to your wife about that. <laughs> um, she would just agree with you. Okay. So let me uh, bounce back to my main camera here, and uh, then we'll go actually into. Let me see if I can terminate this. Uh, there we go. Awesome. Well, welcome to the program, everybody. It's uh, December 11th, 2015, Friday week in review, almost year in review, right? We're getting there. And uh, I got no audio from you, Mike. But um, yeah, so we're going to just talk about everything that happened in the week. We've also got a, a special guest on the program today that's uh, going to uh, jump in and tell us you know, what's going on uh, in, on his end. Um, so I guess what we can talk about first is, uh, while Mike sorts out his audio, I can... Uh, How about now? You're there. I'm back. Good, Jerry. Okay. Go for uh, it, Chris. Okay, so uh, obviously uh, the first news item that we talk about usually is has to do with uh, kind of what's going on in the 3D print world. So... Uh, this one popped up on my news feed. Uh, it's called uh, BR-Print3D, and it's the first real open source printer host made for Linux. So uh, there actually is another print host um, being developed specifically for Linux, and it's called BR-Print. Here's the pre-alpha release. Here's some screenshots. You can head over to BR-Print. 3d.wordpress.com and you can kind of find out more. I think they're planning on releasing it pretty quick, but it's got a built-in slicer um, and it's actually built specifically on KDE um, or it's meant for Linux, you know, so whether you're running Debian or Ubuntu or whatever your Linux distro of choice is, it's good to know that there's just another option out there, you know. There's a few of my favorites, uh, you know, you've got obviously Matter Control, Great, uh, great piece of software um, that the guys from uh, Matter Hackers have kind of pieced together. Another open source project. You've got Cura. You've got uh, 3D Slicer. You've got a you've got a whole uh, bunch of 3D print hosts that run on Linux, but this one is specifically designed for Linux. So um, yeah, just cool to watch out for uh, little pieces of tech like this, and uh, figured our viewers would appreciate it. I do. So I'll have to look into that. All right. Well, we have a guest with us, and you know, he really worked hard to make sure that he was on our show. Uh, because of my failure, I had put an email together and never sent it. So I realized that wait, late last night when I was saying, hey, I wonder what happened to him. And sure enough, it was my fault. So luckily, he's with us today. Alan, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of tell us why you're going to be on the show here because you've got something really cool and Chris kind of talked about this process and we said, man, wouldn't it be cool to do this and we actually may have an opportunity to. So go ahead and introduce yourself, Alan. We've lost Alan. <laughs> do I look lost also? Oh, there you go. Nope. I took care of it. Your, your volume was down. So, no, you don't look lost. So go ahead and uh, identify yourself again. This is Alan Lauderdale from Lexographic Design Group here in Anderson, South Carolina. Uh, oh, I'm actually a sign maker, but um, when I got into the 3D printing business, with business, 
and as a hobby, excuse me, I have a printer bot, twelve foot or twelve inch by twenty four inch uh, printer bot, go large, three extruders. Um, I came up with a lot of things to make it work better, which, with the help of the three D printing community, everybody's sharing things very well. One of the things I, the first thing I came up with was a uh, the bed material where you could. Maybe you know, you could still get it back off and be smooth and all that stuff. It worked fantastic. And then I needed to decorate it. And guess what? There was no way to decorate it. So I joined the hydrographic community, which is great. They have passed out the wazoo for 3D printed objects, but they're pre printed, pre manufactured patterns. And I wasn't able to come up with what I wanted. Which is always never what anybody else wants. Are you still there? <laughs> yeah, we're here. Cool. So I started experimenting with all different kinds of inks and uh, running through the whole gambit of doing it on your desktop printer, takeout printers, and what have you. And since I'm a client actor and run large format printers, I had to find one that would work for hydrographics, and voila. Now I can print custom hydrographics 48 inches wide by 100 foot long. But it's a heck of a lot more expensive than that stuff that comes out of China. Dag nebit. <laughs> so, you're, so, so my understanding, Alan, um, because I know nothing of uh, your background until uh, just about five minutes ago, uh, is uh, you are – so you're custom printing like with a uh, – like an echo solvent printer or like a, uh, like a large format oh. – Printer, it's a you're, format you're, printer, absolutely. So I but, can custom order hydrographic or hydrographic paper that I can then apply uh, to 3D prints. That is correct, mostly. It's not Echo Solvent Printer. I tried that first since I already have a couple of those. Didn't work. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so uh, no to the Echo Sol. So you're you're buying uh, like a like a, a substrate that's the, and then you're printing on it with some UV ink or some some ink. You have yeah. your process that you're working on. But so you can uh, custom order a, a pattern. What's your minimum order size? Oh, just one square meter or ten square feet. Same difference. One square meter. And what's a, what's a square uh, square meter uh, cost a user? Ten square feet. Ten square yeah, feet. One square meter. How how much is that that cost? For, if I was going to order some from you, oh, uh, it's only uh, three dollars a square foot. Three dollars a square a foot. So, so thirty bucks for a for a, a square meter of the material that you could custom hydrographic your own um, your own th your three D print. And uh, and how do I order from you? Well, my email address is sales. Hydrographics.supply, but um, I also have a listing on eBay, custom digitally printed hydrographics film. There's one way. Uh, you can find me on the K2 forums, which is uh, k2forums.com. It's a hydrographic printing, or yeah, hydrographics forum. I'm on a bunch of forums. Uh, Signs 101. I'm easy to get a hold of. <laughs> so hydrographics. Uh, dot supply dot supply and uh, okay and we'll we'll definitely put that link in the show notes um, so people yeah. can find you. So Alan, let me let me jump in here first. Turn your camera ninety degrees right angle. Uh, right now you're in portrait and landscape will give oh, us a. Okay. My apologies. No, that's okay. And okay. actually went to a little screen. Oh well, but. Uh, Essentially, you said you could give us kind of a little bit of a tour. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we did talk about it. Okay, it seems like I'm reverbing out. Mm. Uh, let's see if I can I can minimize that. Let me, let me see if this works. Yeah, maybe we could, uh, Alan. We could maybe just take a look okay. at some of the things that you've printed and, uh, uh, you know. Well, I'd be glad to show you, but here's the quandary on that. I produce the film and ship it out to people that put it on. I don't actually do the dipping sure. what they call it, of themselves. Sure. I do have what I call speed shapes. That oh. 
So this is a Chinese menu, like we really needed a Chinese menu. And I'd <laughs> get, you know. But very cool. That's that's still uh, cool. So you're just you just use somebody's Chinese menu as a sample. Yeah. Well, it's something <laughs> I had. I just said click click. Let's try it out. Uh, Confederate flags. Boy, that was hot last month. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Um, but really, it's here's a. Something you might be familiar with. It's the Monster Energy drink. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 for sure. I think, um, are you doing? The, are these buoys or something? They look like a like a little. What's called speed shapes. They were they were first generated for painters to display their paint on it, automotive paint, so that the angles of it you can tell. What reflections coming in, what not? Oh, okay, okay, okay. And the process for hydro dipping, Alan. The process for hydro dipping. You just need a bucket of water. That's about it. A bucket of water. Well, here's how it works. I print the uh, ink, arrange the ink, so to speak, on a PVA film. PVA stands for polyvinyl alcohol. And then I apply a fixative over the hot top of it to hold the ink together while you have put the film on floating on top of water in a bucket, essentially a bucket. There are gazillions of YouTube videos about hydrographics and very interesting too. So you just and peel then, the film off, throw it in the water. There you go. And then you wait 60 seconds for the film to hydrate. The water is starting to penetrate the polyvinyl alcohol, which is water soluble. And then after 60 seconds of waiting for the film to hydrate, you apply what we call an activator to the back side of the film, which reacts with the fixative that I've put on the film. And then you spray it with a spray bottle? Ooh, no, it needs to be more even than a spray bottle, but essentially the case. You spray it on, out of a rattle can is fine and dandy. Okay, got it. And the it dissolves the fixative, allowing just the ink to be exposed to the surface of what you're passing through the surface of the water. And as it passes through, it's the ink sticks to the substrate. When you pull it out of the water, you just wash the rest of the PVA film off, and voila, there you go. Wow. You can coat it with clear to protect it forever, or just leave it like it is. So here's the speed shapes that's already been dipped. That looked like uh, the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> you got it. Exactly. The Second Amendment has been really popular lately, too. Gee, I can't imagine why. Go Jefferson. Team Jefferson. <laughs> Team Jefferson. <laughs> so, so, Alan, I've got a question for you. Yes, I've please. noticed that the, uh, the objects or models that you're working with are large, and they don't have a lot of surface detail. You know, I wanted to show you this earlier. And this is something that I was wondering could be hydroplane. This is a small little character, as I call her, my tiny wife. And um, <laughs> I had this done with Shapeways, something that I scanned and had Shapeways do for me. And I'm just wondering, could you also do this kind of detail uh, in hydroplaning? Yes and no both. There is a video on YouTube called Computational Hydrographics, if that's what you want to search for. Yeah, we wa we wa that was at SciGraph, right? That was the yep. uh, one of the SciGraph is yeah. 2015. Yeah, the I can print the film for that. What I need from the modeler is a UV map. Okay, because me his UV map is flattened out. I and then you're that. also going to need a way to position it on the actual object itself. So this is right. a true statement, but. So. There are allowances that we can make with extra material on the edges, so if you misalign slightly, we're okay and copacetic. It's mainly for uh, 3D printed objects that aren't like what he had from Shapeways where it printed with color. Right. It's for us obvious that, uh, yep, I got well, white like PA and that's what we're going to print with. Like I mentioned, well, Alan, I, I was going to drop ship you one of these from Shapeways in twice the size of this one and then see what you can do with it and then um, have it sent back to me, uh, whatever the cost will be, and then we'll show it and, and actually compare the two. Um, yeah, and... So probably in the next month or so. I also I also have to add, you know, this just adds to, like, basically another... There's basically three... 
now four treatments you can do to treat the model of FDM, FFF parts so that they get that really smooth surface finish, right? So, you know, one being the acetone va vapor bath thing, which is nasty chemicals and nobody, I mean, it's just not a really, it's, it's yeah. unpredictable process because it doesn't work the same on every part. And, it's, and it doesn't uh, work with PLA. It doesn't work with PLA, and, uh, you know, I do most my, almost everything out of ABS if it's not some exotic material I'm printing. It's, it's usually ABS. But the acetone vapor path is just not a predictable uh, result. Then there's the ceramic beads, uh, you know, uh, sonic tanks that are basically a vibrator, you know, kind of like a rock tumbler. You can rock tumble it. Then And then there's the topical solution where you apply... Uh, either an epoxy resin, you apply a uh, the, some, a product like the uh, 3D uh, XP product from Reynolds Advanced, and then now there's hydro dipping, which actually seems like the easiest, kind of most cost-effective thing. You could basically buy a sheet of a solid color, and you know apply it to your part, and it gives it that real nice shiny kind of glossy. Or do you have matte options as well? Is there have you come up with anything that's like kind of like a matte option? Well, I understand what you're talking about. You're talking about like smooth on product at XTC 3D. XTC 3D, um, that's it. It's um, that's filling in the striations or the interstitial spaces between the layers so that it's a smooth object. Hydrographics don't do that. It's only a colorant. If you leave the striations of the layers in there, it's going to just color down in deep, deeply. Oh, okay. It's a colorant only. The color, the gloss and or matteness comes after the fact as to whether you use matte clear over it or glossy clear. Got it. So. Yeah, and another point is the XTC, XTC 3D, um, is since it's a... An epoxy type material it also adds strength so there is the advantage to continue to yep. use that. I agree what with that. What do you that. got there Alan? This is just a drone space off the internet dipped onto a speed shape. Okay. <laughs> so you got, so you got it makes her look pretty funny, yeah. yeah. Actually it's um, much better now. There you go. <laughs> so you essentially have photographic capability uh, color yes. photographic capability that you can then transpose onto a three-dimensional object. That's uh, correct. So, very, very cool. Well, like I said, Alan, I am pretty excited about getting you a model and seeing what the results will be. Um, so, I really appreciate you coming on. Thank uh, it's, you. It's kind of neat. The number of people who have been in different uh, trades are all coming together with their their particular talents into a three-dimensional world. So that's really, really cool. Okay, well, we're going to move right on into some more news items. Again, Alan, thank you for coming on. Appreciate it. You. You're welcome to stay on and comment if you'd like. But uh, I'll go right into my first news item. And, and actually, let me jump to it. Here is the website that he was talking about, which is k2forums.com. I'm assuming that you provide a lot of feedback in there. But if you want to know more about the hydro... Um, film technology and how they're applying it. This is a great site, correct, Alan? Yeah, absolutely, positively. It's pretty much well the premier site for it now. Okay. There were several of them, but it's just built itself up from yeah. very good management. Well, I played with it, or played with it. I reviewed it yesterday, and yes, uh, lots of information out there, a lot of uh, talented people. So, okay, so on to my first item. Dun -dun -dun. If you remember, Chris, we kind of talked about the N3D. They did a big Kickstarter, got well-funded. Well, I never heard of it since then, but obviously they did move forward with it. You can actually buy them. And here's a great review by Lucas Marion, I believe, from Computer World, which, you know, in the past, when you have PC reviewers trying to do things, um, they don't always seem to come out. But this guy seems to be well-versed in 3D printing. Knows his stuff, and I think it's a great review. Essentially, if you what he says is that if you need a small, inexpensive printer, buy it. It's very quiet, but uh, there's some disadvantages to a small printer. One is build size, and two, what they scrimped on, which is like no power switch, no um, indicators of any sort. Everything has to be controlled through the USB port. And then they says that the slicer that comes with it, which 
you know, there, you can probably use some other slicers. Uh, leave a little bit to be desired, but uh, he said overall it's a great printer. It's very quiet, and uh, he recommends it. Huh. Interesting. So there you go. So if you're wondering what happened to the M3D, it's out there. Ready it's to out buy. there in the wild. Yeah, I actually saw somebody on Kickstarter uh, this morning was trying to have... I, I I find it kind of comical. There's some there's like people. I think they'd like to test the waters on Kickstarter and see what people will actually buy sometimes. But like people will post. This guy posted a Kickstarter to buy me <laughs> one of these M3Ds, right? So like they put a Kickstarter like buy me a printer and I'll print you some stuff. <laughs> but it's like pay me a hundred dollars so that I can buy a 3D printer and then I'll give you you know. Fifty dollars worth of stuff or whatever. I I don't know. It's it's pretty funny. Well, we'll talk about Kickstarters a little bit later. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a yeah. it's a learning experience, you know. And uh, uh, yeah. So anyway. Well, there are a lot of yeah. Well, like I said, we'll spend a little time later on talking about. It. So, Chris, what's your next item? Next item is another three D printed car, but this one supercar. The Blade, the world's first three D printed supercar. So. Uh, Pretty badass looking. the The car itself, wow, the body is not. Yeah, the body is not three D printed. It's actually the frame is a series of nodes that are three D printed, and then connected via carbon fiber rods. And uh, it makes it super light. It's about ninety percent lighter than the average rear wheel drive sedan. So, and it's got a seven horsepower engine. So. And so so it's 630 kilos, so it's over it's over one to one in the power to weight ratio, and it it has a zero to a hundred kilometers per hour in 2.2 seconds. So it's faster than any Lamborghini or Ferrari currently in production. So says this article from Stuff. New Zealand. So and. Uh, Stuff.co.nz is where this article is coming from, and you can see some pictures of it. The Blade 3D printed supercar. Wow, that's interesting. Well, <laughs> as you're aware of, uh, 3D is, I guess, uh, what's the word I want to use? It's integrated into obviously a lot of design functionality. Now we have the, the abilities to create large parts and I think we're going to see more of this. What was the price? I kind of you know, I didn't there. actually see a price listed, but it just could be because my comprehension isn't 100%. <laughs> I didn't really place on the SATs. No, uh, I didn't see a listed price in the okay. article. Well, uh, and if you have to ask, obviously it's not for you. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's necessarily been on sale yet. But no. um, this will obviously be. I would. I would imagine it fetches. Uh, you know, collector's price because obviously being the first 3D printed supercar, it's going to be have some historical value, and uh, probably will end up in somebody like Jay Leno's hands. <laughs> probably. Okay, on to my next item. And I've got a couple. I'm going to run through them really quick. They're more from the design perspective. You know, we've talked about Sketchfab a lot on this show. Uh, we've had actually an interview with Albin and his crew. And uh, what, about, gosh, a year and a half? Almost two years ago. It was one of our first. Um, but they've come a long ways. They really they have. added a lot of features. And, I and the library about, continues to grow. I mean, their yes. library has got. Well, I mean. Obviously, anybody can put stuff up there, but you can now download it if you want to, if they allow that, so you have that luxury. You can also make the items private, but they've just announced and released a new function out of their beta, and that is animation. So if you didn't have enough to be able to... We lost you, Mike. Yeah, so Sketchfab animation was too much for Mike's machine, apparently. Yeah, it uh, the animation is is really a, a, a you know if you're in into game design, you're into uh, even I could see architecture. I could see a lot of uses for uh, wanting to incorporate uh, animation uh, into displaying online. So 
pretty cool. Um, Sketchfab.com. If you don't use their products, highly recommend uh, heading over and just checking it out. Mike, okay, you're back. Be back. You are back. All right. Well, let me bring up the desktop capture. Um, my mixing software, my streaming, has a new version, and obviously it's not as stable as it should be, so I apologize for that. Let me bring this up real quick um, to get back into it. And uh, But, you know, Chris already mentioned it. Uh, Sketchfab is a great program. I was going to show a few more, which I can do very, very quickly here. Um, I think, and in, in another great part about Sketchfab, you know, is they've positioned themselves really well as far as developers. The, they've, they've got an API you can work with. Uh, they've got plugins for uh, even SolidWorks. You can go, you can install a plugin into, or an add-in, as SolidWorks likes to call it. But um, So you can publish directly from SolidWorks directly to Sketchfab, kind of like GrabCAD. Yeah, a lot of applications. Uh, many of the scanning applications now have a direct um, export to it. Or, um, so, yes. And then so here's they, showing, this is an uh, animation of the Tesla. And uh, notice I'm actually rotating uh, the object as it's being animated. Incredible. Actually, and it's got, like, beautiful light uh, rendering. I mean, it's, because I think it's using, uh, you know, your, I, I don't know. I don't oh, we know. We can actually take a look if, at, uh, here's the features, here's the default. If we go to Shadeless, it, as you'll see, it removes the actual lighting. They yeah. now use environmental texturing, uh, which is a very cool feature to give it that very realistic, gritty type of look. I don't think it's, it's being just used here. Unbelievable. Uh, wow. But, uh, if you use the default, you can set up multiple lights. I've used that on some of my own models. Um, so, yes, it has come a long way. It is WebGL, um, so you got to make sure you're using the latest Chrome, Firefox. I don't know if it's um, in Internet Explorer. Um, or if you can use it in what's the Edge. Mac version. Uh, well, that's on Windows, but what's the Mac version? Safari. Safari. So I don't know if it works in Safari. I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, it does seem to work in Android. Uh, I've been able to use it there as well as iOS. So I, think, I do believe it works in I, um, in Safari. So and then there's one more I want to show. Uh, Fat Man. Oh. <laughs> God, and, and the people that they that are uh, that publish up to these, uh, and so you can actually rotate around, right? Yep. Da, da, da. So the people that are publishing this stuff are just so talented. I mean, that is, that is incredible animation yep. to be yeah, sharing, you know, on Sketchfab. And we've had a couple of those artists on, and this is sometimes yeah. where I find them. Uh, Ruslan from France, yeah. who did Van Gogh that we immersed ourselves in. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's got a few more out there, so go out and look at Ruslan. He's got a holiday that hopefully next week uh, he'll be on, and we'll actually be doing something fun with that. Um, so one other thing about Sketchfab. These are very easy. If you want to do animation, if you have some 3D animation capability, you just export it as an FBX. And there you go. It essentially applies the animation routine to your model. You just set up the lighting, and there you go. Okay, so on to your next item, Chris. Or actually, awesome. I've got a couple more. So if you want, uh, you want me to, do you want to, I'll tell you. Yeah, what. just, go ahead yeah, with yours just, on the. Okay. Um, my next one was a pretty interesting uh, take. This is this is 3D in medicine. Obviously, we we cover a lot on our show, and uh, this was something I picked up, kind of like on the uh, more distant radar. But this is HP, who obviously has been developing their own uh, kind of, we think, polyjet type uh, process uh, for their machine. And you can see some kind of leaked pictures or pictures that they've put out PR. But this is uh, HP partners with a 3D medical software company called EchoPixel. Uh, a developer of 3D medical visu visualization software, and they're collaborating with HP to deliver a new virtual reality technology called True3D to the healthcare systems. And uh, I did a little digging a little deeper on EchoPixel, this company, and they offer uh, basically the ability to do not only uh, anatomy studies uh, that are virtual anatomy studies with uh, just certain VR technologies that are already out there and they're kind of working on their own. But 
they're actually looking at doing what we've, what we've been covering, which is like for pre-op planning, is taking CT data uh, or any DICOM data, crunching it together into visualizations that you can then dissect and study through a VR platform. So, you know, this is just yet another uh, uh, kind of medical kind of technology that's going to make pre-op planning easier and better. And actually, if you go back to my AWE uh, live interviews when I went to the AWE uh, show in, uh, where was it at? Somewhere up in the Silicon Valley. They uh, had an actual demonstration of that. This is very similar to the technology uh, done by a company that actually was out of Yugoslavia, uh, one of those countries. Remember that little thing with the, the little item that you could move around and you wore those um, polarized glasses. Do you remember that, Chris, that I had in my office? Yeah. Uh, it's the same technology. So uh, the A Da Vinci same. system or whatever. Da Vinci? Uh, yeah, what was it called? 3D Da Vinci or something 3D like Da Vinci, that. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, so same technology, so it's pretty cool, and it does. I, think, I don't know if you remember that. It really comes out of the screen. Yeah, that, I think uh, a lot of these technologies, Mike, you know, and, and that, that one in particular... I think I've, I've lately. It's funny. I, I. This is just my take. Um, but and I would love to look at statistics on this and probably look at some. I'm sure there's plenty of talks on this. But uh, one of the things like Sketchfab. You know, you notice Sketchfab or GrabCAD. These kind of front runners in the tech, you know, tech world or any of the. Um, they they have open APIs. So they make development of software. They make development of the system itself super easy to integrate with or kind of come up with your own software. And so I think a lot of the front runners in this world, and that's where I think Oculus kind of has, uh, they, they've done a really, really good job is pushing out developer SDKs and APIs for the developers, right? So, uh, oh, yes, yeah. Uh, so I think, I think that, I think, a lot, I, I think some of the kind of like the low liars, they need to kind of take a hint from kind of the bigger companies that are, in the front, in the lead, and publish their APIs. Put out. Don't try to protect their technology too much, because it's all. At the end of the day, it's all about being able to use the technology. And you know, people will buy it whether it's protected or not if the API is open. So. Yeah. Well, it takes time, money, and obviously support to create an API. Sure. Uh, if you remember, uh, Occipital has done a great job. Um, That's since I develop with their SDK, uh, sadly it's mainly for iOS, which sadly or not sadly, uh, and we've been able to do some fun things with that as well. Uh, who else is out there? There's a few other people. Supposedly the Valve, uh, uh, which I was going to bring up a little bit later. So when we get into our, I think the scanner, DNA. I think the scanner world, like Occipital, they're a front runner. I think that that's one of the things that they, that's one of their strong suits. But some of yep. the other scanner companies, I think they need to take a hint and. Uh, well, or or not. No. <laughs> um, okay. Well, let's move on to a few more items. Um, let's kind of move it along. This is something, you know, Chris. I know you're probably aware of this because you know you do have some stock in Apple. They had introduced the iPad Pro a couple of weeks ago to mixed reviews. I had actually had an opportunity to finally get to an Apple store and look at one. And you know, a lot of people complained that it was a super-sized iPad. They talked about it being a uh, serving tray. But my thoughts are, having worked with some larger tablets, it actually is pretty cool. It's lightweight. It's still thin. And... Uh, you know, I could see using it if I had the extra money, but now we're seeing a lot of applications uh, being put to use with it. It's got a very fast processor, and one of them is like the one I have behind me. It's UMake, um, which is a, what would you call it, almost like a 3D sketch rendering application, taking more from the freehand functionality and incorporating it into a 3D application. So unlike Fusion 360s and others, which you do have the ability to create sketching and then extrude another thing, this works basically from that perspective. Um, the sad thing is that I found, and I will get into the app here in a second, is you know here's your the people behind it. Uh, pricing, even though you can 
get it from the iOS App Store for free, the starter only gives you the ability to do 10 designs and save as a PNG. Now, this is a 3D application. That doesn't really offer you that much. You can't export your model unless you go to the Pro version, which is $14.99 a month if you move into it right now, or $149 a year. That's not too bad for a subscription, but I'd really like to be able to uh, look at one of these applications, try it out, export the model before putting down any money. Uh, you know, it does say here if you decide to go with the annual subscription, you'll get a 30 days free. I don't know if there's a money back functionality normally when you use things out of a licensing system in the iOS app system. That's not what you can do. Um, I don't know because if they've gone to a subscription they get around that so I'll have to look into it but I think they should at least allow the export one model out so you can test it. If you do go with the pro version if you do provide OBJ and IGs and I think that's IGES, not I, well, IGES format which is a solid format so that you can bring it into maybe another application like Fusion 360 or SolidWorks. So I will move right on to uh, the screen itself. This is the program on my iPad Air 2. Um, it works with several of those capacitant type um, pins and then I have another one which I don't have down here. Here are some examples, let's see if I can bring this up, called Chair. Uh, one of the things that I notice is that it wants to force you through a tutorial which, you know, I'm a little impatient. I want to get into an application and start playing with it. I didn't really like that. Um, but I think if you want to be able to use it, like right now, I'm using one finger and notice how I'm immediately drawing. All the rotations tools are done with two fingers. So, you know, I like to use one finger to move around because a lot of the other um, applications I've worked with are intuitive from that perspective. And but if you want to zoom, you pinch and zoom uh, like you normally use on many of the iPad applications. Let's see if I can shrink this. Thing. Um, to rotate, two fingers again, you just twist. But then they have this little orbit and you can't, yeah, you can see it. Um, off to the side here, if you click that, that provides you the ability. Let's see. I guess you have to hold it. If you hold it down, then you can rotate uh, using one finger. And then uh, two fingers, you still have the pan capability and then the pinch and zoom. So that's kind of neat, but then you're, it becomes a two-handed operation. So if you're familiar with the program SketchUp, it kind of reminds me of that as far as what it does. And then here, obviously, is a tray. I play with it just a little bit. I'll have to play with it a little bit more. You can assign different pens or pen widths. And then uh, you can draw like I'm doing here. Right now, there's still 2D objects. Uh, you can create a mirrored functionality. You can, over here on the right-hand side, uh, go to different views, uh, like an orthographic perspective. Where is that perspective? And then uh, right and left sides, obviously, and then top side, bottom side. So very quickly, you can pan through the different views, uh, and then you can go back and forth with undo, redo. And like I said, in the basic version, I didn't get an option. Let's see what happens when I do this. Uh, you can put it in. Well, it shows an IGES, so maybe you do have something. Let's see what happens. Okay, so you have to upgrade in order to use the IGES functionality. So this is something that's be kind of gotten some buzz because the iPad Pro has introduced, I think this was in the, the introduction of the iPad Pro by Apple, uh, as well as some new Adobe products. Um, so if you're interested in doing 3D on your iPad or iPad Pro, you might want to look into it. Just remember there's not much you can do in the free version except learn to play with the tools. Uh, you'll have to actually subscribe to it. Which then brings me in to my next item, which I'll drop out of this. And that is, oops, and that is Fusion 360. Look familiar? So Fusion 360, um, if you're not familiar with it, is a tool 
made by Autodesk that works on the desktop, Macintosh or PC, but they also have an iPad and Android viewer with the ability to create notes and annotate. And you can immediately just put in your user ID and up comes all your designs. So this is, if you're not aware of it, the uh, Neody VR loop that I had designed. One thing that I learned very quickly is to create, now I can't think of the name of them, uh, in your designs, separate components. <laughs> That's yeah. important. Um, yeah. Otherwise, they don't show up. Um, and plus, if you start animating and creating some of the hinge and operating functionalities, components are extremely important. Um, yeah, yeah. So you can definitely design, like SolidWorks, any of these uh, parametric modeling applications, you can uh, design really complex parts if you want, but it's much better to design an assembly with a series of parts that... Exactly. Uh, you know, and beca because another benefit being that you can, with kind of your advanced modelers like SolidWorks or even Fusion 360 or Inventor, is you can have driving geometry that's actually just basically sketches underlying that are hidden, and they may have like, let's say, a whole size of, you know, uh, 25 millimeter, and then if you change that one sketch, it will drive the geometry and all of the parts throughout the assembly. And uh, that that comes that becomes a very powerful tool, you know, kind of as you get more experience. Yeah, and that's something they've introduced about six months to a, to a limited extent in Fusion 360. Uh, you do have the ability to call what they call V-references or... V references, I can't remember, V references or H references to other objects um, so that uh, you can use those as masters. Um, you do have the same type of history tree, um, but you know, it's it, it's a lighter version of both Inventor and uh, SolidWorks. I like it because it allowed me to get my feet wet, and but I have, I think, advanced fairly quickly into it. Um, the tools are cool. Render is uh, pretty cool. I use that a lot. And I started using these new features, which is creating animations, which will load here in a second, I hope. It's loading. It is. Um, Ooh. So, I mean... It, it's, it was just a playing thing, but essentially yeah, once you create cool. your component, you can do explosions where the parts all explode from the main detail, um, or you can have it rotate and zoom in on a particular piece, and then you can annotate at the same time. So that's something also infusing thing. But the cool thing is, I didn't know that I'd be able to actually put this on my iPad and bring this somewhere. Now, the question is, and we're going to go over to it a little bit later, is this something that you should move into, which and you can see it behind me, an iPad or an iPad Pro or go right to a Surface. And my opinion is probably if you have to spend the money, you, know, you either get a smaller iPad for $300, $400, and a Surface or go right with the Surface because the Surface gives you the full application. You don't have to go back. And I was going to give an example today, but uh, I ran out of time because uh, I want to do something else on my it's not necessarily a surface. I, if you remember, Chris, and I don't think you've been in the episodes, but I've been using the HP Spectra X2 because of the RealSense camera, but it's, it's very similar to a surface. Um, so, you know, you, there's a lot of trade-offs there, but if you're an engineer or a designer uh, in 3D, even using SolidWorks, I'm probably thinking the surface might be a better bet or the surface book uh, than going with an iPad. Uh, but now that you have this capability, you could put it on your phone. Uh, it's free. So the Fusion 360 viewer is free. Okay, well, Chris, I'm going to we'll go back to you. I think I had one more item, um, but let me regroup, and then uh, we'll get back to me. But, Chris, what else do you have? In yeah, the so our next section, obviously, is the 3D Scanner Darkly uh, section of our show where we talk about uh, 3D scanning tech and... Uh, I have one that's kind of fun. I just happen to find this, and uh, I don't really know how, but there's a product out there now called uh, Capturing Reality. 
um, you can head over to capturingreality.com. And it's a, a very powerful tool that professionals um, use to capture uh, LIDAR. It will take point cloud information from laser scanners, LIDAR, uh, and even photogrammetry, and it will it will plug it in. So they have a promotion right now where you can actually download a full version of the product, use it for free through the 31st of January 2016. So you just go over to their, uh, I, I thought it would be a good tip for our listeners, uh, and reward them for their loyalty, which is uh, head over to capturingreality.com and there will be a link in the show notes, and you can download this product for free and use it through January 31st. And a uh, really powerful tool. You can look at some of their showcases of some of the stuff. This is especially helpful for if you're a drone pilot and you're trying to do aerial surveys and do uh, some constructions. Um, I guess it's a very common tool in this field. Uh, it is, and then there's one other that is very common as well, especially in photogrammetry, which can't come to me right now. And then, as you know, we also have covered the Autodesk, what is it, Memento, uh, in the past. Uh, yeah, and Memento is still coming. free, and it's beta, but still this beta. is kind of, uh, but but Memento only, only captures uh, photo. You can only upload photo. Uh, no, you can actually bring in uh, other stuff now. Other point cloud information? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's so, uh, a strength to use large point clouds, and sure. one of them was using photogrammetry. Yeah, and, and Memento is gr I, I, I personally, I, I want to use Memento more. I actually, I have some projects that I've been meaning to get to on Memento, but that runs on the cloud. This is kind of like more on your own hardware. So, you know, kind of the difference, uh, there, the, you know, there's, there's obviously uh, people that like to run stuff on the cloud. I, I like the cloud because, you know, your computer, I, I'm already using a lot of resources as it is. And uh, to offload that to the cloud seems like a practical a practical option for me. But, um, you know, if you've got a lot of firepower to use it, you know, on your computer at home or at work, then this might be a, a good option for you. Well, and plus, if the cloud's not there for you. Um, you have no internet or whatever, limited internet. Mm -hmm. So Fusion 360, as I mentioned, has a pretty decent rendering engine that can be used on the desktop, but you can also send things up in the cloud, and I played with that a little bit. Um, and, and it provides basically what you can do on the desktop, but you can offload it and go back to designing. So that's a neat thing about the cloud, because it becomes a separate renderer that doesn't tie up your machine. And uh, so I've been using that, and then you can send up multiple renders, but it does take a little bit in these cloud um, so yeah, I'm going to try that. That's pretty cool. Um, I was going to bring up an Android application that does, fun, or an iOS application uh, that you can download, but we'll hold that off to next week. Um, one of the applications, I'll bring it right back up. Here's the link out to iTunes uh, for the Fusion 360. There's a, uh, a similar one for the uh, in the Android Play Store. And so you can download both of them, and they're both free. I didn't get into my uh, my 3D in medicine, but I'll get into it very quickly. I had a video, but I'll just skip it for now. Craig, do you know uh, Craig Venter, Chris? No. Well, Craig Venter, is a, you'd like him because he's an interesting character. He went against basically the U.S. Genome Project and funded his own genome project and beat the U.S. government to the punch, per se. So he's been very outspoken. He's created the first artificial life form, uh, at least and there's been some debate on that. But now he's come up with a way of using your DNA to actually create 3D structures, and in this case, predicting what you look like based upon your DNA. So <laughs> the reason I brought it up is you know, we've got all these 3D scanners to scan people's faces. Pretty soon, you just need a drop of blood, and then we can create a 3D replica of an individual. And here they showed what he looked like at 43, and then see how he's merged the face, and there's a video out there on him. So if you want to know more about <laughs> where 3D printing is going, um, not only are we looking at it from an organic uh, perspective, but we've been able to 3D print 
uh, likenesses of ourselves in plastic based upon our DNA. So very interesting. So um, my scanner darkly is just a brief update on ITSIs. Let's see, do I have it here? Uh, I don't know if I do, so I'll just leave it. ITSIs 3D does work with the iPad Mini 4. So if you have an iPad Mini 4, it does work with it now. Uh, I think that came out about a week ago. And uh, let's see what else uh, I had for 3D scanning so we can get out of this. Oh, I'm going to jump over to my other camera. Actually, I'll tell you what. You know, let's see if I can do it very quickly. Why don't you go ahead and cover one more item, Chris? I'll set up my other camera uh, so that we can give a small demo. Um, with the Connect 2, they just came out with the Windows software. So if you have a Connect 2, you know, that thing that came with your Xbox One that's collecting dust, you may have a use for it now. So, Chris, <laughs> take on the next item, and then I'll set up. Okay, my next item. I'll just move right into the Print Whisper since we're approaching pumpkin time. And uh, I'm going to give you my Print Whisper tip of the day is uh, to go buy one of these whether it's Amazon, Draftsman Store, wherever you are, this is a tool, really handy tool to have. It's called a contour gauge. And uh, this one, I, this is just one that's out there. This is $8.25. $8 and what a, a contour gauge lets you do is it's not only got like a ruler for size scale on it, but it's got all these little pins. And what you do is if you have an object that kind of has a complex curvature, you can stick a contour gauge onto the object and then you can set it down on a piece of paper and you can trace that line that the contour gauge comes up with. And so, you know, if, if you have an object that you're trying to capture, you could 3D scan it, um, but if you're trying to capture parametric data, a lot of times it's quicker and easier to actually uh, pull real measurements uh, or contours off the object itself because you can isolate just that contour. Now you can do that with scan data, but it takes time and sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes the scan data needs to be cleaned up and it can take more time than just sticking one of these on there. So this is a great tool to have in your arsenal contour gauge. Um, I use use this tool all the time <laughs> and, and uh, tools like it all the time. Um, I have a bunch of tools that are kind of like this that are just cheap and uh, so so yeah so you just stick this on whatever you're gonna you know kind of your complex shape and they sell big ones and um, but I find that uh, a small one is kind of just as you know it, it comes in handy for most of uh, most of the things. This one is six inches and it'll give you an overall travel of five and a quarter inch. So, like if you had a, shan or a, a you know a candelabra or something, you wanted to trace the profile, you could lay the con candelabra down, but it would be kind of awkward to like kind of lay it down on uh, you know on a table and try to trace it. So you can just stick this thing right on there and then lay this flat on the table, and it kind of helps you capture geometry that you wouldn't otherwise be able to capture. So tip of the day, go out there and pick yourself up a contour gauge. I'm going to get one. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to jump right to, to my, my camera, camera here and to my other part of my stage. <laughs> so as mentioned, can you hear me? Yeah. Oops. I have to come up with a wireless mic. Can you hear me? That's good. OK. So. Um, what I've got here is a, oh, I'm back on the stage where I was eating cereal, how funny. <laughs> but um, what I've got here, and I'll show it, is the HP Spectre 2, and the new application that allows me to uh, use the Connect 2, which has been collecting dust, <laughs> uh, because one, I've been busy with other scanners, um, and the main reason I got it was to be able to map out uh, joints for animation and haven't gotten around that yet. So I thought I'd try this out. Here is the application itself. Uh, here is the Connect 2. And if you remember, the Connect 2 works on a different principle than the structure sensor. It uses um, what they call time of flight functionality versus uh, structured pattern uh, detection and uh, includes some lasers and obviously a camera. So I'm going to hit the start button. 
And uh, I just lost my ear mic, so just go ahead and bear with me. So I am now positioning it in front of, you know, my, my assistant here. I've already forgotten her name. Stella? No. <laughs> but uh, she's, look, she's looked better, I think. Got it. I'm going to go ahead and hit complete. So it should be capturing. Okay, let's see what happens. There we go. Well, that was pretty easy and painless. Let's see what the quality looks like. Eh, it's a little blurry there, but this is the first time I've done it. It says one or more objects are invalidly defined, so I'd have to repair it. But uh, there you go. You can't actually see it, but I'll bring it over to my other camera here. So let me, hopefully this won't kill the program. There, here Don't kill the program, Mike. Don't kill the program. So there you go. So it's very simple using the Windows 8 slash 10 uh, app interface. Very clean, pretty easy to work with. Uh, I was able to capture very quickly. Um, so if you've got one of these Connect 2s laying around, want to put it to use, um, you just need a USB 3 and a fairly beefy machine or one of the new Surface tablets to be able to use this functionality. And I'm looking at Chris again, so I didn't switch cameras. There we go. So sorry, audience. I apologize again. But there you go. This is on the, the Spectre X2 from HT, a Surface tablet, uh, what do you want to call it, clone. So if you've got a Surface tablet, uh, I have a USB-C to USB 3 port, and obviously it does seem to work. I forgot what my assistant's name was. Do you remember, Chris? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Man, she's looked better, though. Yeah, she's, she's, oh, she's lost some weight. You leave her in the tech case. So there you go. It's free. It's in the Windows 10 App Store. And, uh, yeah, something to fun to play with if you're wondering what that thing is that was you had with your Xbox One that never got used. Okay, so move. You said you were pretty much done. So let's see what else I've got on the agenda outline. Um, so we got some VR corner items. One, I want to reintroduce, and I'll bring it up first. Remember this, Chris? Our friend from Germany with the VR Spectre. Spective. Despective. <laughs> yep. Well, it's Stutzy, and Stutzy. Uh, they've got a sale going on. What's kind of cool about it, it's hard foam rubber, very lightweight. And <laughs> because it's hard foam, it's really easy to cut up and convert. Like this actually has a wearality in it. So if you remember, we had them on. That's the Fresnel lens system, so I've converted it. Um, it comes with the actually with a head band, uh, and then I got a rubber band to hold the phone in. But, you know, it's very versatile. So if you want to experiment with VR but uh, want to do some of your own things, uh, this might be the trick. Uh, it's a little bit better than cardboard, but still you can play around with it. They have, because I complained to them, I put some soft foam in there. I said, hey, maybe you need to add some soft foam. So what's funny is that Stutzy said, hey, we've got something for that. Obviously, they realized that the cardboard may not be so comfortable. So they came out with the Pulvinet, very smooth VR experience. They had a little image here of a guy with Band-Aids on. <laughs> How to prevent getting cut up from your cardboard. So buy this little soft kit from them. It's only 395 euros. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> support the Stutzy cause. <laughs> uh, I like the guy. He's pretty fun. So, you know, shout out to our friends out in Stutzy. <laughs> and obviously, they've got a little bit of humor as well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, let's see. Google Cardboard. Hey, you got an Android phone? Try this. It's been out there for about a week. I've made several of them and had them up and loaded. And uh, because my application wiped out, I don't have them anymore. But uh, this is Google Cardboard Camera. 
And what it does is it allows you to take panoramics. Yeah, we've been able to do that before, but it allows it to be done in portraits. So you get more resolution. It's about 7,000, 8,000 by, I don't know, 8, 9, 1,900. Fairly large. Problem is they're in JPEG, so you do get some artifacts. But they use the same, I'm assuming, jump technology uh, when you're viewing them, and it gives you a spectacular 3D effect. Sadly, it's not on iOS. And the other sad thing is if you take them, you can't share them. So hopefully they'll get that done. Uh, we have some workarounds where you can import them into the folder and it'll recognize them. But most people won't do that. They want to be able to click on it. It has a few demos. But again, you have to have an Android device. And uh, you also have to have, uh, you know, obviously a good camera on your phone to get some quality ones. I have some. You can go out to my Google Plus site. In fact, um, I'll tell you what, very quickly, I should be able to load one up. Okay, let's see which one. I like this one here. So this is a little shrunk, but as you can see, it creates a panoramic. This was done out here at the San Luis Obispo um, Madonna Mountain back in the area. I kind of like this. They've got trees from Oregon selling out at the Madonna <laughs> farm. Um, but uh, essentially, you can use Google Cardboard or any Google or VR experience to look at this, and the 3D effect is spectacular. Um, and I have some theories on that uh, I will have in the show notes, my Google Plus article that I wrote on this. So, yeah, pretty cool device. So let's see. That's, um, oh, and then one more item. If you're a programmer or a developer and wanting to create VR, Unity 5.3 just came out. One of its main feature, other than some cool new development tools, so like me, I'm very excited about that. Um, better management tools, new 2D tools, and dun, 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 uh, the efficient rendering is going to be cool. But uh, where is it at? VR is now. I mean, it's been in there, but now it's supported. So if you're working with the Oculus Rift, Samsung Gear VR, you can now support it directly within Unity. Uh, Google Cardboard has had some pretty good tools already for Unity. Um, so I have not tried these yet, but uh, it's built in. You don't have to really load anything. Just click VR and you're done. So it'll be fun to play with it. It's got some samples in there on some of its techniques uh, that it uses for gaze control and uh, moving your head around to target and shoot and things like that. So if you're into Unity, which I am, um, head out. It's a free application. Pretty much everything is available in the free version. Uh, some of the pro things allow you to keep your money if you exceed a certain amount. And uh, some more, uh, what would you call it, larger uh, shop type tools for integration and utilization uh, with a larger team. But other than that, the free version pretty much has everything. So go out there and try it. If you're somebody young trying to get into 3D gaming or VR, this is a perfect tool. Uh, Unreal Development uh, or the Epic UDT, UDK, UDK is also free. Uh, I think the learning curve, in my opinion, is a little harder. I used that a long time ago. Plus, I feel they're still stuck on baking, which takes a little while to get your final results. This is also almost instantaneous, gives you immediate feedback. I think there's a little bit more programming involved in Unity, um, but even then you can get some add-ons to make that easier. Okay, well, that is VR, cor cor geez. <laughs> VR Corner in a round room. Thank you, Mike. Alder needs to learn to speak. All right, so I know that you got to get going. I like to bring up a few more items in the spelunking. And, you know, Chris, we kind of talked about this. Thank you for supporting me. I did a Kickstarter on a little product called Neody VR Junior. Well, You're doing a Kickstarter. Well, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't resign myself already, but uh, um, I didn't give it a long time because my main goal really was to try and get some of these out to children's hospitals. That really was my main goal, but maybe enough people out there would be able to uh, possibly back this and make this available for all kids. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of reasons, and I won't get into them. 
Uh, I could have probably spent more efforts in it. I tried to create some cutesy videos that you can actually move around in. Don't know if you played any of these, uh, Chris, but this this is actually a 360 video that I'm sitting in. Uh, mm -hmm. It does work on Google Cardboard. So I tried to apply it. It's got some demos in there. Uh, kind of goes through the history of Looks like we lost you again. Well, Mike's telling us about his uh, Kickstarter project that uh, is really cool. Um, the Neo DVR for kids. There you are. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, yes, there is a Kickstarter out there. If you want to go out there, it'll be in the show notes. You know, the minimum that you can pledge is $5. There's only a few more days on it. But the other thing I wanted to talk about is the VR Miracle. As I said, I'm wanting to get 100 of these in hospitals. I've already got backing from Shapeways, uh, Grip and Shoot, which is the Grip and Shoot handle, um, Homito, which creates that one VR headset. Um, a lot of them have already either given me huge discounts or actual credit. So we are putting together a unit uh, that's called the Neo DVR. Let's see. And let's see if I can bring that up real quick. Okay, there we go. So oh, I don't want to post, I want to look at. So there's an update on there talking about the uh, VR Miracle. There's a lot of posts that I've done on it. Uh, trying to look at my updates. Here we go. So you can go out there and read it. It is available for the public. Uh, I have created a new version of the NeoDB Junior that's called Clippy. Um, one of the complaints was, what if I don't have an iPod Touch 6G, which is a valid one? The Clippy kind of solves that. You can now clip this. Uh, to something else other than an iPod. And uh, let's see. Need more. Should be an image in here. There we go. So there's the Clippy. Still uses the handle, but it slips onto your device. And uh, it's a little bit more easy to work with. I will make this available through Shapeways in my own store if the Kickstarter is not funded. In my mind, it probably will not at this point. But uh, so, if you're still interested in that, but who knows? Maybe we'll get a hundred people to. Well, exactly. and it's like uh, it's like I've said before, Mike. Is uh, th so the the coolest cooler. It was the it's the highest uh, the highest uh, amount ever raised through crowdfunding yet. Set the record last the, this this year, and uh, they failed twice. Failed twice. And on the third go round, and it's the same product as, but just uh, using Kickstarter, you know, and campaigning it a little bit different. So don't give up. If you, I, I've told this to people before, um, you know, because I have clients that do Kickstarter or try Kickstarter, because um, it seems like a pretty good way to raise capital when you're in the beginning. Uh, don't give up, you know, and look, find the weaknesses in your. Uh, and and try to turn them to strengths and take your strengths and make them even stronger. No, that that's good advice, Chris. And no, I haven't given up. Um, I'm probably going to try Indiegogo. Uh, as you know, I've talked about my Neo DVR loop, and that was one of the things that came out. It's like, oh, I like the Neo DVR Junior, but what about the loop? <laughs> so maybe. You know, maybe there isn't as big of a market. You know, Mattel did come out with their Viewmaster, and I've had some some feedback on that. But uh, uh, you know, Mattel is a big company, and they do a lot of advertising. Um, Google Cardboard, you know, can't beat a simple cardboard product um, for kids. So, I mean, there's a lot of competition out there, and uh, you know, I did get some backing. Uh, the big thing is to, to get some awareness that this can be used in hospitals and it really does seem to help kids. So on that note, Chris, I think that's about it for today. Uh, unless you've got anything else. News-wise, you know, the holidays are coming up. I do want to identify, if you want to help us out, 
Um, I'm working with Clint over at the Slow Makerspace. We've kind of amended <laughs> over the, the couple of years. So if you don't have anything to do on 1221 at 6, was it 6 p.m., come visit them at their new location. So I'll put that in the email. So if you're not familiar with them or if you knew their old place, they now have a new larger place. And uh, we'll be assembling these things there. The kids are going to be coloring on a label to put on the back of the new cases from Grip and Shoot. Um, so please, 1221, 6 p.m., new location will be in the show notes. If you don't have anything better to do or if you know somebody else who wants to come out and visit, we'd really appreciate it. So awesome. Please. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks to our listeners. We will see you next week on another episode of All Things 3D.